and a welcome. First of all, I want to thank the Johnson A. at Osamwan Leadership Institute and the Graduate Women in Business Club for sponsoring this great event. And I want to thank um, Blanca Ripoll and Caitlin Schellen for uh, putting this together. I know there's a lot of background work and they have the IT expertise as well. So I wanna thank them for all of their effort in this. I wanna welcome our entire audience and thank you for joining us for a great evening of leadership. Um, if anyone has any questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat. I will monitor that and at the end of the session, we'll end with a question answer. So it is my honor and uh, privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Kim Stone is in her second season as the general manager of the Chase Center after joining the Warriors in April of 2019. Ms. Stone, who has over two decades of experience in venue and operational management in the sports and entertainment industry, oversees all of the Chase Center operations. Following the inaugural season, Ms. Stone was recognized as one of the most influential women in the Bay Area businesses um, by the San Francisco Business Times and the Chase Center was named Sports Facility of the Year. So um, she hopped right in and um, got to her stuff. So um, additionally, she was named to Venues Now second annual All-Stars list. Prior to joining the Warriors and the Chase Center, Ms. Stone served as the Executive Vice President of Development for the Miami Heat and the American Airlines Arena. While she was General Manager, American Airlines was named Best Arena Experience by the NBA and hosted four consecutive NBA finals. In her time as general manager, Ms. Stone oversaw more than $60 million in arena enhancements and renovations that uh, kept American Airline Arena among the most state-of-the-art facilities and also earned many accolades in sustainability. Ms. Stone has been the recipient of many honors, awards, and accolades, including a few years back, she earned the Leadership Award from the Johnson A. at Osamwan Leadership Institute. We are so proud that she is a former king, and I feel she is certainly a woman of influence and a most incredible leader. Um, I sincerely find her to be one of the most incredible leaders I have ever encountered, and I say that sincerely. And I'm very honored and privileged to have her here with us tonight. So, Kim, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Cheryl. I mean, wow, what a what an introduction. I just want to say, you know, shout out to the U. Uh, I even though I'm on the West Coast now. Uh, I will have always valued my relationship with the University of Miami, and I'm sure many of you who are on today know that the roots run deep and you'll you know, always be a, a, a hurricane. So thank you. I, I always jump at these opportunities, um, Cheryl, to do it. And, and the list of accolades is long, but this is Women's Empowerment Month. So my message to all of your speakers, um, in, or sorry, attendees, in addition to those who are the women is, you know, I, I want people to understand, I want you to ask me any questions today, because this is about what is possible and what can be. And what I have seen in my career is that this is a real opportunity moment for people. It might not feel like it. It's COVID. We're, we're all still learning new ways of working. Um, but there's also an awareness that I see in the industry now, uh, people that have a new sensitivity and understanding and awareness about the value of diversity and diverse voices in the room around the business table. So I just, I know all of us has been having, it's been a rough year uh, here at Chase Center. We still don't have fans at our games, although we're hopeful that will change soon. 
So I understand it's been a year. And so it's like, how can, how can you be looking at this as a positive, but the silver lining in, in what has been an otherwise horrible year uh, that has decimated my industry in, in particular um, is that there is this, there's a new opportunity, a new awareness. And I just wanna encourage everybody today, please ask me any questions you, you'd like in, in the chat. Um, your education matters, but grit, determination, perseverance, and uh, as Michelle Obama said, go high when they go low, uh, will get you very far in life. <laughs> so Cheryl, I know there were a lot of great questions about uh, the pandemic and the challenges during the pandemic. So I'll, I'll sort of jump in on those first and thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance. I'll, I'll go down that as well. But I do wanna encourage, uh, just use the chat to ask questions along the way. I'm happy, Cheryl will uh, monitor them and definitely stop me so we can dig in deeper on a topic if you like to, uh, I'm happy to. And if anybody's got uh, from the Bay Area and if anybody's got great restaurant recommendations out here, please send those in the chat too. Uh, we're starting to reopen. So I'd love to do that. Does that sound good, Cheryl? Certainly, but um, don't forget Miami has great restaurants too. So if you wanna come back, we'll show you all of them. <laughs> I, I was fortunate to visit uh, last month, early last month, and the influx of people coming to what used to be our hidden gym, so to speak, it was amazing. I, was, I couldn't believe it. It was fantastic um, to see Miami so vibrant and you know out here in the Bay Area the conversation has been that tech companies are fleeing the Bay Area um, and, and heading to Miami and to Texas and you know I just think I think the ones the smartest ones end up in Miami <laughs> is, is my opinion but anyway um, yes I restaurant recommendation Miami I'll take those <laughs> as well um, but let me jump in uh, one of the questions was around navigating around uh, one of the challenges of the pandemics and you all have, have had to do this and we continue to do this. It's the complexity and ambiguity of the situation that we face on a daily basis. Uh, you know, we're, as human beings, we liked definitive. We like to know what day can we circle on the calendar that, you know, we're going to return to office or whatever it might be along this way. So the complexity and the ambiguity and then the amount of time we have been in this situation has created what I think is probably something people don't talk about a lot, um, which will be, um, you know, people's mental health. So I want to make sure all of you know and are checking in with your friends and your family, um, because it just has taken a toll on so many people. So that's, you know, that's an important component of it. But the ambiguity and the um, complexity, how have we navigated through that? What have we done as a leader in the most uncertain of times in the history of my career and my life? You know, what are the sort of things that I did? And so where there is ambiguity and complexity, you as a leader should try to give some sort of focus to, to your, your team that you're leading. Uh, in my situation, when the pandemic hit initially, we didn't know if sports was gonna be shut down for a, a week, a day, a week, a month. Turns out it's more than a year. Um, but what we did is we organized quickly and we knew well, what I knew from my time in uh, at American Airlines Arena, having navigated through Zika and MERS and some of the H1N1 and some of the um, viruses that we had previously that were never not on the scale of this, was that we needed to pivot quickly because this was a threat to the health and safety of our guests coming in the building. We were used to um, protecting and keeping people safe from physical threats, right? Like bombs and mass shootings. I mean, I'm sorry, I have to use those words on this call, but that's sort of as a general manager or anybody organizing large crowds, that's what you have to be worried about. Now this became this invisible threat um, against people. I will forever remember COVID as the time that I thought my groceries could kill me. Um, and, you know, wiping down with Clorox the front and back side of my potato chip bag. Right, like that, I will always remember. Well, fortunately, the science has evolved. Um, but what we did here is we moved immediately and um, took our team and we had about 80 people and we, we got them to work on uh, reimagining the event experience around what the existing science was at that time, which was there was concern it could be you know spread, spread through touch. So we, we got to work quickly and the byproduct of that was about uh, six weeks later, we ended up with about 120 page 
uh, event manual that was all redesigning the event experience. And we thought, I was hopeful we would be able to get back up and running by this uh, MBA season, which would have been, which normally starts in October. So we, we still have that plan. We still could execute that plan. But what I've noted, but what I've seen is the science has evolved. And so what, we, what you have to do in these ambiguous situations is find somebody that can be the person that's like on a daily basis, helping you understand the evolving science and helping you have your response to the pandemic. And so out here, I was really fortunate um, that Jackie Ventura is our Director of Facility Health and Hygiene. That was a brand new title I put her uh, into as soon as we got into COVID. And that is her daily job. Her daily job is to read the CDC updates and, and then she guides our pandemic planning and our processes. And so she is fantastic. She's an expert. She does incredible work. I am so grateful that she chose to come out here um, to be with, be with me because she's, she's fantastic. And so what we, the result of this is we have stood up a world-class on-site testing program. So we test everybody who comes to our facility. So whether it's a dark day, it's a, if it's a staff, we test them. And then on a game day, again, we are having games, they're just fanless. We end up testing about 600 people. And so Jackie has been the key person to stand up that testing. And it sounds easy, but it was far from easy because you, you didn't know which test would be the test you should buy. Test inventory was in short supply. Uh, but this organization as no, is known as being sort of out in the forefront. The other benefit we had is our owner, Joe Lakeup, got his master's in epidemiology and then just happened to then go on to get his um, MBA at, at Stanford and became um, a venture capitalist in med, med tech, the medical field. So he was well positioned to understand this and how it was going to evolve. And he has been spot on. So he has really led us through this and then <clears throat> we've been organized. So, you know, it was just really navigating around all of that amb ambiguity and complexity. And I'm sure you all feel it in your lives, but you know, being able to make sure you're paying attention to the, the mental health of your staff. You are um, giving staff a goal and a focus. We check in every week. I've got multiple, I, I meet with my um, v, my direct reports three times a week. Like even when we were in the office, I didn't meet with them three times a week collectively as a group. And so that's been really important. So we're sharing information, we're clarifying things on a consistent basis. So the communication has gone up dramatically. Um, the focus coming out of, out of this is to make sure that we're instilling public trust and consumer confidence in coming back to the event experience at Chase Center. So again, Jackie, was we were a first mover. We're one of the first sport, sports facilities to get certified as one of the, it's called GBAG, it's Global Bio Risk Advisory Council, gave us a certification that says that we, we are cleaning to the highest level possible and we are disinfecting such that we kill viruses like COVID. And that's an important thing. That's a third party organization coming in saying, yes, Chase Center's protocols and policies are at of the high, highest standard in the world. So that is still, that wasn't us saying it, right? It, it's not us saying we're doing all these great things. It's another outside organization holding us accountable. So that's been um, really important as well. And then I already mentioned what the new ex event experience is gonna be. You know, we're hopeful that in the next, you know, handful of days, you know, I don't know, 60, 90 days, maybe we will be able to have fans in our building and welcome them back. And when they come back, it's a very different experience than when they came the first time. We've gone cashless. We've got, you know, very high um, cleaning protocols. We've got certain areas that people can and can't go into. So we've had to redesign the experience. So the, what we have to do is double down on engaging with our fans, making sure that, you know, coming to the venue is a challenge Anyway, just you know, traffic, the typical things in advance, now you've got this other threat. So we are working hard to make sure we keep our standard very, very high. Uh, when prior to going into COVID, uh, Chase Center, we do a lot of surveying and we knew that our net promoter score was at a 45%. Um, and that was the highest of any new NBA arenas that had been opened in the modern time. So we're really proud of that, but we know coming out of this, we've now set that, we need to be at 60%. And so we've got a challenge because we've got these new processes. So it's like reopening a venue with all these new processes and we want to have an even better experience. So that's the way we sort of challenge our, ourselves here. 
Um, you know, and what I can't wait for is the roar of the fans. When we get them back in and you've got the tip off and the crowd roar, even if it's, you know, a couple thousand versus 18,000 that we can have here, that's what I miss the most. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And I, we, we do know that industry surveys and reports say that when events come back, they will come back, <coughs> excuse me, they will come back. There's a lot of pent up demand for events and uh, we're real excited about that as well. So it's been a weird year. It's been a weird two years in San Francisco only because we, I came four months before we opened Chase Center. Then we opened Chase Center, which was a great experience. Got high praise as, as, as you mentioned. And then we were operating for only six months. We only had 78 events. Um, before we went into shelter in place and started working from home. And so I think last week was our anniversary of working from home. So it's been a new world as we look ahead to next year. Um, but it's, I love a challenge. Those of you who know me know I love a challenge and it's, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning every day. And uh, I'm excited for what, what will continue to be a challenge. So, so Cheryl, I see a couple of questions. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask you um, some questions. Well, um, first of all, if you could tell us a little bit about your leadership journey and how you got to where you are today, being a woman and at such a high um, level in a position that is more frequently held by men. <laughs> Great question. Um, so my lead, I'll start with my leadership journey. So I am fortunate that uh, during my 23 years with the Miami Heat, the organization itself went through uh, a, an evolution, right? In 2000, we opened American Airlines Arena. And I, the reason I, I say that is because that was a time of great growth that happened. So the company went from being a tenant in the old Miami Arena to now um, operating an, an a NBA facility, an arena that was going to have sports. So you go from just doing basketball games to now you're doing concerts, you're doing family shows. And so there was lots of opportunity. So I, again, I mentioned, I love a challenge. So I just kept raising my hand. So I, and, and asking for opportunities. And one of the opportunities was um, I had been in the, I was in the PR department and we knew that we needed summer programming and the WNBA team provided that opportunity to have some summer programming because the NBA season ends <clears throat> in May or June. And then you've got, so that means you have July, August, and September, three months where you don't have a, a resident. So that's the WNBA teams are in the summer, primarily because they started as um, a way to add some summer programming for arenas because concerts, which are the typical uh, content in the venue, they go outdoors during summer. Okay, so I tell you that because I, had the opportunity to raise my hand and said, I really would like to learn how to, I really like to um, run the WNBA team. I have a passion for it. I love the business. It would get me over to the business side. And so I got that opportunity. And in that opportunity, I was so fortunate. I reported into Michael McCullough, who's a world-class uh, chief marketing officer and is still with the Miami Heat. So I, I got to have him, I reported into him on all the business operations. And then I reported into the general manager for the basketball team, who at that time was Randy Fund on all basketball related matters. And so I used to call it, I was an executive in training wheels because I would just, they would lead, they would empower me. They would give me resources and I would march off and try and implement a sales strategy or try and implement a marketing campaign. But I always had them and they always answered my call, whether it was, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning or 9, 9 p.m. at night. They were always there for me. I learned so much by uh, being like trained by them. So that was an amazing opportunity. And I realized in that opportunity though, that I have a BA in, um, PR from the University of North Carolina, which I value. I value that. However, I realized that, my gosh, I needed to really get my business acumen up a little bit because I hadn't taken any accounting courses in my college years. So I, that's, when I, that's what led me to enroll at the University of Miami in the executive MBA program. And that was a game changer for me. It was really made me start to understand business on a deep, deep level. It, was, it is why I have such an affinity uh, for the school is because I learned so much. The professors who taught in the course were some of the best you had um, and may still have at the University of Miami in the business school. And we would go in there and learn 
from the very best about, you know, the best operations management. We would learn about, you know, the best accounting processes. We would, and so it, I, it just fed this thirst. And then I'd go in on Saturday and then I'd come out on Monday and I'd go to work and I'd say, hey, we just learned about this new concept. And what do we, you know, could we do this? You know, I would bring ideas immediately to bear into the organization. And so I was, I, I just got an opportunity to really, it was a paradigm shift about how I saw things and how I saw business. And then that just led me to have an opportunity to really, you know, better, better run the Miami Heat or sorry, Miami Soul and better, you know, become a, a more sophisticated, more knowledgeable um, leader as it led, as it related to the business side, because you need the business side. I mean, we're, we're talking to this is a business school leadership series. So we know that. Um, so that experience um, and then getting my MBA, unfortunately, the Miami Soul team, we only had a three year operating rights agreement. So we we gave it quote unquote, handed it back over to the MBA at that time. And then I had an opportunity to become the chief of staff for our the current president, Eric Woolworth, who is somebody I just can't say enough things about. He is my mentor. He has been my champion. He is somebody who always saw in me opportunities and capabilities probably greater than I saw in myself. Um, and so I, I had that opportunity for two years as his chief of staff. So I, you know, was, um, Sat next, sat, sat next to him, understood how he saw things, would represent him um, in meetings that, you know, he couldn't attend. And that was an amazing experience. And then in 2004, we got Shaquille O'Neal and I became the vice president of uh, season ticket services and retention, which is one of our largest um, revenue generating departments in the organization. And I loved that. It was so much fun. I learned it. I didn't, I didn't fully know it, but I learned it. I absolutely love that. And I actually did that all the way until just about the time I, I came out here to um, the Warriors. I just, I, I love people. I, I love that. I, I love the brand that we've built in Miami. So that was, that happened in 2004. And then 2006, um, my, my boss came back and said, would you be interested in being the general manager of American Airlines Arena? And I didn't have any facility experience. And I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, I'm not hiring you to change the light bulbs. I'm hiring you uh, because of your leadership skills and your ability to, to take this uh, where where we, we want to see our vision be. And I was like, you know, all right, fine, I'll try. Uh, so I did, and I, I really enjoyed that. I love the facility industry. Um, it's full of great people. So that led to, um, I did that for many years. And then as we were learning new innovative uh aspects of the business, like business intelligence, data analytics, the mobile app, those are things that um, I tended to be where they would start, the idea would start, and I would try to get them up and running, and then if, you know, where appropriate, you know, <clears throat> farm, you know, uh, hand them off to other departments that made sense. I just tended to be a place where things, would, ideas would get incubated, and then if they made sense to stay with me, they did. If they didn't, we would, you know, we would hand them off elsewhere. So that's really, so I've touched every line of business, basketball, um, arena and uh, team business at, at a pro pro league or pro team, I should say. And I'm so grateful for that. And I learned from some of the best leaders, you know, working with Randy, working with Michael, working with Eric Woolworth, being around Pat Riley, my first four years, um, you know, having the wonderful opportunity to, to travel with the team. Uh, those are things you can't, you, you just, you learn through osmosis and on some of those. And so I, I, I say I am the leader today because of the, the leaders I was around who were so helpful and uh, guiding me and guiding my career. And they would let me make mistakes and then they would correct me, right? They didn't, they didn't, they weren't, heli they didn't helicopter over me. They made, you know, they gave me the tools and resources, let me make my decisions, would counsel me prior to, you know, executing a strategy. And then if the strategy didn't work out, you know, we'd have, we'd sit down and we'd do a little debrief and I'd learn from it. And so I'm so grateful for that process. And it's so the combination of all of those things <clears throat> that have led me to, I think the leadership skills I have today. The final um, ingredient I think though comes from, um, being a, a I'm, I'm very competitive. I've played uh, team sports my entire life. And what I really enjoyed was I was never, I was never the star on the team. I was always the defensive specialist, uh, which is code word for, you know, she gets to go do the tough assignments and she doesn't get to score any points. Um, and that's okay because what I learned from that is that everybody has a role on the team. Team sports taught me how to overcome setbacks. It taught me how to practice. It taught me, you know, how to goal set, how to work toward them. It taught me that hard work does pay off. And it taught me that sometimes you can have the best game plan and you fail. Um, you just can because of, because of that day. And sometimes it taught me that the more you prepare, the more you are and the way you can upset others. And so those, those 
life skills I learned in sports combined with sort of just this mentorship that I've had throughout my life at an amazing organization, which is the Miami Heat, um, has just, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> go ahead. Were you finished? <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, no, I I was just, I think I got put the exclamation point on <laughs> on the leadership. So, so my message to it is it's your journey. And if you can be very intentional about who you follow as your leader, right? The, their their skill sets, their capabilities will have a profound impact on you. Um, but then also know you are an individual and you are responsible for your own development. So out, throughout life, you should you know always continuously try to um, learn leadership styles because. The world is constantly changing. And if you don't evolve as well, if you don't learn new skills, you know, you will find that you may quickly get passed by or your leadership style may be no longer uh, the type of leadership style to get to get you to the type of performance that's expected. Right. You can't can't always rely on it. You always have to. My experience has been, you know, always continuous and never ending improvement is sort of a personal motto. And I'm actually enrolled in a, um, a course right now, a certification course right now about the psychology of leadership. Like I know, I understand leadership, but I understand the psychology of it, you know, influence, persuasion, those sorts of things. It's been fascinating. Um, I love it. So it's just, even at my level and, and what I've done, I always feel like I can get better and I can learn more. So, so I'd say those are, it's a very long answer for, I think this is, um, those are the key ingredients uh, for my, that have been the forces and the dynamics on me to, to get me to this level of leadership. And it's not easy. I mean, I don't want, I didn't just wake up and this happened. I've had some real hard life lessons um, when we didn't, when the, when we had to give the Miami soul back to the NBA, so to speak, you know, it was a really hard lesson for me in life. But again, this is where I fell back on my team sports experience. <clears throat> you learn that setbacks are temporary. It's how you respond to them that makes that can make them permanent. Like they can just be temporary and you just keep, pick yourself up. You know, Dwayne Wade used to have a, a, a saying that was actually in the uh, locker room. It may still be, but it uh, said, cause this was an infamous line that he said once uh, that was a key to motivating the team. He said, fall down seven times, get up eight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is, it, I mean, that just sort of sums, sums it all up uh, quite well. So uh, what is the biggest risk you've ever taken? Moving to San Francisco, <laughs> for sure. Like I will say, and here's why. I mean, I just explained how amazing the Miami Heat is. And it's an organization um, where I could have retired. I, wonderful people there. I love that place. I have great friends. My best friend um, still works there. So like it, it, you look at it and go, why leave, right? Like I, but, but for me, it was, so it was a big risk because I was coming out and the other thing, Cheryl, and this is probably something that, you know, I, I, people look at, and well, let me say it this way. If I came out and joined the Warriors just four months before we opened a $1.6 billion venue. Okay. So let's just billion. So that should tell you how sophisticated and elaborate this, this building is. And, and it's actually a whole development. It's the arena plus 29 retail restaurant spaces. So I tell you that because a friend of mine said to me, and um, he, he's a good friend. He said, you were like a bulldog that just bit the back of a car and it was going 60 miles per hour and you didn't even know what the car was. And uh, I always laugh at that because he's, he's right, four months to pull together a team and get them through the opening and the expectations were through the roof um, and rightfully so. And I was hired and I was about the 10th employee hired within six weeks after I was hired, we had 172 employees, wow. right? And they were all reported up to me, you know? So it was like just this volume and velocity of change was quite high. Um, and so, you know, I just sort of, I just, I wanted to come out here. I love the Bay Area. I always have. Uh, Rick Welts is our president and, and I know his leadership style. I had a great leader. I wanted to go and work for another great leader. Like that's really important to me. Um, so that, and then I wanted to do something that was transformational for a city. And um, Chase Center has proven to be that out here um, in San Francisco. So those were the reasons, but it was a big risk. 
because I was really, um, I love Miami and I love that organization. So it was um, something that I I did because I, I wanted what I, I, I always say, I wanted a second chapter in my life. I wanted to see what else I could do. Um, and, and this was just a unique opportunity to come out here, but it was a big risk. It would have been much easier to stay in Miami and continue to do what I had been doing. And we were very comfortable and in, in, in terms of our, we have lots of friends, 30 years in a place, 30 years. I don't have 30 years left in my life to make the kind of friends and, and do the kind of things that I was able to do in Miami. Um, so it was a big risk, uh, but so far it's paid off. You know, it, it really has. And even with COVID and even though we've only had 78 games, I mean, this, at this point, I should have already run 200 events, um, had we had, had COVID not happened, but it's, it sort of is, it is what it is. Um, and we just, we just sort of roll with it. And so that's been the biggest risk, but you know, the, there's a saying that, um, that, you get, get comfortable being uncomfortable because being uncomfortable is where you grow. Being uncomfortable is where the risk is. Um, but the things I have learned coming out here um, and the experiences I have been through are, I can't even describe them, how they've made me an even um, better leader, a better person. It has been an incredibly challenging time um, but I, it's made me a better person. So, you know, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, the best opportunities are on the other side of your comfort zone. <clears throat> and sometimes I think we all mistake comfort, you know, comforts for security. And the reality is like, there's, you know, there is reward and risk. I was talking to, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one of our owners today and, um, he said to me, he said, he said, leaning into risk when it is the riskiest time to do it is where you get the biggest payoff, right? And so, because uh, we were just just chatting about sort of the the, the whole COVID experience and, and Chase Center, and you know this is a this is uh, it's Peter Goober, and he's a Hollywood legend for a reason. And he uh, was a producer on Rain Man. He ran Columbia Pictures. I mean, very incredible, incredible. And I really appreciated his um, insights. So it was fantastic. So you know, the other side of your comfort zone, it, and it's a risk. And and we we all are very afraid of risk. Um, but, you know, my family was on board. The people who mattered to me were on board. They were confident in coming out here. Um, and so it, 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 the risk that has paid off. Great. So how many employees do you manage now and how do you stay connected with them and how do you keep them happy? Yeah, <laughs> so keep them happy. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do that one last. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. So it is, we Unfortunately, <clears throat> we had to do some downsizing in COVID. So my staff is right at about 100 now, and that's our full-time staff. And so building up op arena operations, overseas um, housekeeping, security, engineering, event services, guest experience, um, event um, content and programming, which is booking of the building, the security, both event security, building security, uh, the food and beverage uh, partner, our um, police and fire relationships. So and I, I just give you all of that background because when we are in an event, we have almost, well, uh, let's say when we have a sold out Warriors games, our um, event staff is about 2000. So the 100 full-time employees and then about 2000 event staff. But, but Cheryl, it's not about me in that situation, right? It's about making sure that those, the staff, my, especially my direct reports, that they are as empowered and have all the resources and know that I believe that they can do their job and do it to a high, high uh, potential. I really believe I work for my staff and people have heard me say that before, but it's because it's not about me, it's about we, and that's, that is a slogan, but the reality is I know that if I may help them be successful, if I help them achieve their potential, then we all win in that situation. You know, so I have been really fortunate. So in terms of how do we stay in touch? I think I mentioned it. I meet three times. We over communicate. That's just what we have to do. I meet three times a week with my direct reports. We now have in one of those meetings, we have our directors join us. So their direct reports join us. It's a nice big meeting and the directors run that meeting so that we get a good flow and they get to ask us and they hear straight directly from us um, any answers to any questions and thoughts they have. 
Every other week, we do a division-wide um, uh, business meeting, and we it, we usually cover some important business topics because it, it is a business meeting after all. Then we will have uh, some updates, critical updates, and uh, from various departments. And then we always try to end with something fun. We when we first started, when we first went into COVID, we created something called the Care Committee. And so this is uh, about five people in our arena operations division who they just touch base with people. They call them. I, I tried to call everybody um, when we first went into COVID and, and it was great. And I liked that experience. It's just not realistic to think I can call a hundred people each week, <laughs> like through COVID, it just doesn't work out that well. Um, so the, we created the CARES Committee, they reach out, they subdivide and they touch base. And so through that, the goal and purpose of that is to get a pulse on the emotional well-being of our staff. So if there is something that they are concerned about and, and through that process, we've had some issues you know, come to the forefront that maybe wouldn't have if we didn't have that avenue for them to have that conversation because the care committee is comprised of people from our division who are very trusted. Um, they know people will keep their information in confidence. So it's been a great, it's not, it's not an HR function. Don't get me wrong. This is the cares committee. And so, because we care and, and they also are the fun committee. So they create some fun, social happy hours, things like that for us to do. So those are some of the things we've done. And I think an amazing thing that our president did is when we went into COVID, he started every single day writing something that is now affectionately referred to as the daily. It is a daily email where he writes about a topic of interest. And what he has done is he has allowed um, other people to author the email on a daily basis too. And so like in during Women's Empowerment Month, we are hearing from uh, women who are parents and some of the struggles they've had through COVID. Uh, during uh, last month, which was um, Black History Month, we had uh, same thing. We had lots of contributors there talking about, you know, just sort of, we called it like they, 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 they had, um, showing us insights into their life and what's happening with them. So through this process, we've really become more compassionate with one another because we've gotten to know each other through a simple daily email that our president, every single day, our president writes this email. I mean, it's amazing that he has done it um, and he's a gifted writer. So uh, everybody really looks forward to it. So those are the, some of the things that have really helped us navigate through. And we've actually, I think, uh, created a better culture through this process of just really getting to know one another and having great empathy. Um, COVID has thrown our personal and professional lives together like no other. We are through Zoom, through the, you know, the magic of virtual meetings, we are literally sitting in each other's homes during, during it. <clears throat> we have kids run through the background. We have cats walk across the keyboard. You know, you have funny things happen. And so there's just become um, this, an informality to it and a compassion, under, compassion and understanding because here, even here in the Bay Area, most of the kids are still not back in school. So but for those of you that are parents on this, um, you, you're probably like, what? You still don't think they're still at home learning? Yes, they are. Um, they're working quickly to get kids back in school, but it's been a year of learning from home. And so that means there are some parents where you have, you know, both parents who work and they have kids now and they have to be, you know, uh, a worker, they have to be a parent, they have to be a teacher, they have to still cook, they still have to, I mean, it's a lot uh, to be asking um, a lot of the staff. And so just a lot of compassion and empathy has gone gone a long way. Good. Now, um, I do have a few sustainability questions for okay. you. So um, I know that she, uh, the Chase Center has achieved the rare honor of both the gold lead certification and also the Global Bio-Risk Bio Advisory Council STAR um, that you spoke of that um, gave you accreditation for stringent cleaning and disinfecting protocols. So how difficult is it to reach those achievements and what, can, what recommendations can you give others in trying to attain that level of distinction? So the, be, be, you said it well, because they are a level of distinction, they are hard to attain. Um, but what they do is when you achieve them, you it adds to your brand in a very valuable way that helps tell your story in an even more impactful, right? So for example, with LEED certification, that means that we are good stewards of the environment is basically how people understand that. 
the certification process, which I know Blanca has achieved there uh, for the University of Miami, which congratulations on, on that. Um, the, it's no small task. It is months and months. And it is a very thorough process looking at your, your operations, your maintenance, your protocols. I mean, it's a very thorough and, and often it makes you a better operator. It doesn't always mean more cost. It doesn't mean, you know, it can also mean that you become more efficient because you learn through the process as well. So I think if you can, as an organization, achieve a certification that it, I, let me put it this way. It is like an NBA player becoming an NBA all-star. That's rare. Right. It's, it's 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 a rare group of people. So there's 300, about 300 NBA players and what, 30 of them are an all star every year. So that means you're in the top 10 percent. That same that is the same philosophy that happens for a building. So when a building gets lead certified, cons consider those buildings. Those are those are all star buildings, though. You can know that those buildings are operating at the highest, most efficient level possible and that the people who are operating them have a commitment to the environment. Um, and and then in the, the GBAC, the star certification, that's the that's the certification now for COVID and, and fighting these deadly viruses you know, which we hope, we hope things end with COVID, but we've all heard, you know, that we will probably have to, much like we get flu shots, we'll have to get COVID shots on maybe an annual basis. Um, <clears throat> so we just don't know what the future is going to be like, but those are important things. So that's what leads certification, GBAC certification. So, you know, if, and they are hard. They are not easy. It's going to be extra work that you have to do. Um, and then somebody just asked in the chat, arenas are usually big menu, music venues. That's true. Will the Chase Center host music events in the future? Yeah, yeah the future despite COVID concerns. We will host events um, in the future, but we can only do it as when the city and the state say that it is safe to do so. And they will also tell us what the protocols are that we can operate under. So uh, outdoor venues in the entire state of California just got guidance last week about how under what conditions and what protocols they can reopen. So we know out here, baseball teams and soccer teams, their seasons will be able to start on time. They will be able to have reduced capacity fans. And then there's additional protocols they have to do. We know and have been told by the state that there will be indoor guidance um, issued in the next 30 to 45 days. And once we have those, then we'll know the protocols we can do and how, how we can reopen. Vaccines are speeding up this process. Um, that is one thing that we have seen in the Bay Area is as the vaccines are rolling out and more people are getting fully vaccinated, um, we are seeing them open up uh, a little bit more. And in terms of when will concerts come back? So the concert industry has, the, the business model doesn't work unless they can have a sold out concert. So the concert industry won't come back in full robust terms until we are as a country across the country able to host full venues. You could have a tour start and just do a tour on the East Coast. If, if suddenly all the East Coast major cities that normally host um, events can have full capacity, you may see like an East Coast uh, tour do, but concerts typically like to tour the entire country. And so, um, we, our magic ball says that sometime in the fall, um, concerts, indoor concerts will come back um, starting sometime late fall, early uh, winter. Outdoor concerts, and here there's big festival concert, uh, sorry, big festival season in the summer and amphitheater, they will try to open this summer to limited capacity. But again, it, the limited capacity constrains their ability to be profitable, so they won't. They likely won't open until they can get a capacity total that um, achieves what what will at least give them a break even. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah, and someone else also asked. Then I think you answered this, but will all basketball venues open at the same time or a venue by venue um, basis? It has been. Um, so all NBA venues are hosting games. What is a regional approach is whether or not you can have fans, right? So there are 30 NBA teams. I think last, as of this week, 20 of them can have fans on some in some capacity. Um, I think, 
Utah may be hosting the most fans at about 6,000. I could be a little behind in my update, uh, but they have 6,000. So they typically hold about 20,000. So what they're, that's about 25% capacity and they're the biggest right now. Um, and so the, it's, it, it is a region by region approach about whether or not you can have fans. And um, so that's a good question, but that, that's how it is at this time. Okay. Okay, um, from a sustainability standpoint, what's being done to counter the effects of waste by fans and talent when it comes to, say, concessions, merchandise, and how are these buildings trying to reduce their carbon footprint? So we're really fortunate here in the Bay Area. That's a that is one of the main uh, focuses of of just the community at large, um, and so that means that the waste hauling services are already um, set up to have your trash uh, uh, diverted out of the commingled approach, right? So what, what does that mean? That means when you come to Chase Center and you're eating your hot dog and you've got it and you've got your Coke and you're walking around and now they're empty, you will know, most people in the community will know just automatically that the hot dog container uh, or vessel they call it is um, recyclable. So you'll walk up to a west, waste receptacle and you'll have litter, recycling, and compost. And so if you if you didn't finish your hot dog, you'll put it at, they, they already know to put it in the compost. They'll take the vessel that you were holding the hot dog in because it's recyclable, you'll put it in recycling. And because you had um, your Coke uh, drink glass cup, thank you, cup, was plastic or have something else, you know you can't, you have to put that into the litter, um, which is the, the landfill. So I say that because we already have a culture out here where people are already sorting their um, waste in an appropriate way, but then not everybody gets it right. And so what happens is it comes down to, our cleaning staff gathers it all, brings it down, they break open these trash cans, wow. these trash bags, they put it out on what we call a sorting table. And we literally have a big uh, infographic that says, as they look at the trash, they can see what goes where. And then they start to what we call sort the trash. And so they ensure that things get put in the right way. And here's, here's what happens. Because it is so, it has been a focus in the Bay Area for so long, the trash haulers know by weight how whether or not we are properly sorting our waste and so when we first started we were learning new we were we 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 weren't getting things you know 100 right and so we got a warning from our trash hauler that we weren't properly diverting our waste into the proper streams and that we were going to get fined twenty five thousand um, dollars on a monthly basis if we didn't figure it out so we figured it out in a week because uh, we weren't going to get fined. And it was just a matter of we had new cleaning staff that wasn't 100% sure. And that's why we started to put that infographic up. So people knew that the hot dog container went into the recycling bin and we we avoided the, the fine. So there's fines, there's penalties, there's just a culture out here, you know, already. And so, you know, the, the thing you can start with is just, you know, at, you know, making sure you at home are properly recycling or in the office you're properly, properly recycling. I mean, we at my house, again, there's a compost. I have to compost um, at home even, and you'll get fined at home if you don't do it. So it's a bit of a stick approach out here. So using a, a carrot approach in um, the other communities that aren't as knowledgeable um, is a good way to start. And you just have to have the infrastructure in place, but it is, it makes a big difference. I mean, it really, really does. And it's, a, it's something, so we have trash, so we have litter, which goes to landfill. We have recycling, which goes to the to the recycling um, recyclers, I should say. And then we've got compost, which goes to the the natural sites, right? So it's really um, it's really fascinating. And but we're set up for success, and it's important out here. And uh, it's been I've learned the a lot from this process. We we recycled in in Miami at American Airlines Arena. We did a great job of it. Um, but we weren't composting at the level that they're composting out here. So I've learned a lot. Okay, hey, I think we have time maybe for about three more questions. So we have so many, I don't know which ones, but um, how do you manage work 
life balance and how do you met, um, emphasize that for your staff? I know you have a really busy job where yeah. you have to do events in the evenings. Yeah. Um, I have a philosophy called work-life harmony. It's not balance because balance for me, to me, the word balance means it's 50-50, right? And it's not 50-50, not in these jobs. These are very demanding jobs, but these are jobs where um, you do have downtime. So it's really about looking at it through that. It's like work-life work harmony and making sure um, that I can't be home all the time with my family, but if there's, you know, if there's an important thing for my family that means a lot to them, then I need to, you know, the work would become second in that situation and doing that activity with them would become number one. I mean, it's just, so here are some examples. Oh, the other thing we do is lead a, a pretty untraditional family style life, but it's not, it's not odd. It's not that odd. So in Miami, because I would, Typically, an event would start about 7.30, so our doors would be about 6 o'clock, so about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I would start walking the building. So my family, <clears throat> they would cook dinner, they'd come, we'd come to, they'd come to my office, we would eat dinner in my office, an early dinner in my office from 4 to 4.30, and then they would leave, and then I would start walking the venue and, and work the event. So we would just have early dinner at mom's office, you know, like that's, that's untraditional, but it's what we would do, right? And so that's harmony because my wife didn't mind and my son thought it was fun. Um, and so it didn't, so that's just, but you have to have, uh, you know, a, a partner that is okay with that, you know, um, and, and that's what, and then the final piece that I do is it's called a uh, glass ball, rubble, rubber ball. And I learned this from um, Cynthia, Marshall. Cynthia Marshall, she is the president of the Dallas Mavericks, tells a great story about in life, you have rubber balls, you have things that are rubber balls and you have things that are glass balls. And rubber balls are things that if you drop them, they will bounce and they will come back. And glass balls, you know where this is going, you drop it, it shatters. <clears throat> and that's how she makes family decisions. So she, she gave a great example of how she was an, a high powered executive with AT&T before she became the Dallas Mavericks pe president. And so she, there was some important bill in, um, that she and the lobbyists were saying that she needed to go to Washington DC from Dallas and lobby these senators. It was so important, it had to happen that time. Well, her son was having his first ever swim meet. And so she said, she looked through the rubber ball glass ball and said, those lobbyists will be there. That bill is has got you know another month worth of work. She said, that's a rubber ball. My son and his very first swim meet is a glass ball. I'm going. So she went, so she said no to AT&T and going to DC and, and lobbying the politicians that were important for her business and said yes to her son. Because she said, because then after that, all of my son's swim meets became a little more normalized and they weren't special. And so I didn't have to be at them. She said, so that, and I just thought that was a simple but eloquent way to make those trade-off decisions that come when you get to this level. Um, you know, you also know in sports, there's, a, you, you also understand that like we are entertainment. People don't entertain themselves from nine to five. They entertain themselves at night, weekends and holidays. And so, you know, coming into this, that that's just that that's going to be when you're working. Um, if you're an event staff person, great. Then all you're doing is working the event. But if you're in management and if you're running a team and you're part of the strategy and business decisions, you're going to have to work during the day and then, you know, execute uh, the event at night. And it's just sort of a, a reality of the business. But if you if you strive for work harmony, it takes the stretch stress off of thinking of it through the lens of balance, which I don't have balance, but I, it goes like it's a teeter totter, right? So that, but that teeter totter brings the balance um, into my life and into my family's life. And they are very happy, well-adjusted uh, family who, you know, we love each other dearly. So that's what's worked for me. I like that word harmony. And I'm sure your son has great memories of his early dinners with you. So oh. I hope when things open back up, you can enjoy that again as a family. Thank so you. recently, Jeremy Lin of the Golden State Warriors handled racism with elegance and grace. How do you encourage others in your organization to communicate the core values and live those? Um, that's a great question. And just to be, just to clarify one thing, um, Jeremy Lin, 
he is playing for the Santa Cruz Warriors, which is our G League team. So I just, he's, oh, he's not okay. on our NBA team. It's okay. It's, I just, I, I, it's important for your audience to know that. Um, but that, but that aside, he did, and he did well said, whoever mentioned that, that, that was very eloquent because um, what happens in our organization is since this last year during COVID, we have had a real focus on racial justice and educating ourselves as a company about this because we don't stand for it, we don't tolerate it. And that process um, has really had us all take a hard look at ourselves and it sort of level set what the expectations are in the organization. So I give this organization amazing credit for the real hard social justice work we've done. Um, and it was, a, we, in, we had a seven week long a uh, two hour course once a week. So it was seven weeks, two hours each week. So that's 14 hours of my time. The company said, yep, you, sh you can participate and you should participate. And I learned so much about the history of racism, why it is systemic, what are microaggressions, how to handle them, how to be a much better ally. I thought I was an ally, I was an ally. Um, and, and, it was just amazing. It was transformative for us. So we all learned how to how to do this, no matter where we were coming at this issue from, no matter our level of knowledge about it, no, whether it was you know personal knowledge or, or not. So th that was amazing. <clears throat> and then we do have, we have a great culture. It's a culture of winning and excellence and always doing the right thing. And we have values that are well socialized uh, when you are hired part of the onboarding program, you learn the value that's called, it's the acronym TEAM. So it's trust, empathy, accountability, and modesty. And so those are, so it's well socialized. We work, you either have culture by design or culture by default. And this organization really focuses on being intentional about our culture so that we have a culture that we want to have instead of a culture that we, we create because we aren't being as intentional. And that's how you end up. And then Jeremy, Jeremy Lynn, there's also the aspect of it that he's just a great human being, right? Like he learned from our framework, absolutely. I mean, he wasn't involved in those trainings, but he's just a great human being. Good. And um, our last question then is if someone wants to emulate your path as a general manager of a sports arena, what advice would you give them to get there? Uh, three things. One, leadership. You really, really got to refine your leadership because you're going to be dealing with the owners and you're going to be dealing with the drunk person at the end of a show. You know, that you're going to have, and the range of people that fall in between that, you have to handle and man be able to manage every single one of those conversations, those, those situations. I'm not kicking out the drunk people at the end of the night. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes a drunk person ends up being somebody that requires my attention and it gets escalated up to me right so I, that's that's all I, that's what i'm saying i don't get in the weeds all the time but but you have i just give that example so you see the range of the type of people so your leadership matters your leader your situational your ability to do situational leadership matters really that's really really important number two is this is big business as i mentioned this is a the chase center and the development is a 1.6 billion dollar venue I mean, that billion with a B, it is one of the, it is the most um, expensive arena in the um, U.S. And so you have to understand the um, financial ramifications and you have to have a real good handle on a p and um, All you have to be an ally with your finance department because you control so much of that and you have to drive that business because they, there's an expected return on this investment. Um, and you have to under, so you have to be financially savvy enough that you understand the levers of the organization so that you push them and move them in a way that makes it a prof, makes it profitable. You can't just be a good operator. You have to be a good financial. You have to be financially savvy as well. Um, so those two things. And then I think after that, I think you um, you do. I'm an example of, I didn't know the industry, right? I just, as, as I told that story earlier, I, you know, just, it was more my leadership skills that got me that opportunity. But then I dug down and I learned and I, I call, I've affectionately referred to my first three years as general manager as my boot camp because I think I worked every single event from a 
small breakfast, lunch, or coffee, you know, sorry, a small coffee event done for breakfast. I wanted to understand how our um, food and beverage provider, you know, uh, managed that to the big concerts, the big sold out 360 degree shows and, and the Miami Heat NBA finals. Like you just have to be willing to put in the work if you don't know a new um, area that you're being put in charge of, you need to do the work to understand what's gonna happen. So I appreciate your time today. I know we're, we've reached the end, but thank you all. And thank you for the great questions. Thank you for um, coming to us and giving us all of these leadership um, tips. I know all of us will go away with a few of your sayings that uh, you also got from others, but um, it was amazing to have you here tonight. And um, don't forget the you, you know, you're yeah. always in our heart. So thank, thank you, you so much, Kim. And I see the messages coming through, thanking you as well. But you're greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much to an my, incredible leader. I thank you. My, my pleasure. I love the you. And I'll see all of you guys soon. Bye-bye. Bye now.